perhaps no other century in human existence experienced the terrible and remarkable contrasts of the 20th century. The century was heroic and tragic, progressive and reactionary, forward-looking and frighteningly regressive. A century of contradiction, confusion and massive change. But the nature of human beings had not changed, and it is that basic nature, more than anything else, which is the determining catalyst of human history, certainly the history of the 20th century. Faith and fate will focus on how all these events and occurrences impacted on one specific group of people, a people whose survival has defied the ravages and challenges not only of this century, but of the over 40 centuries that have led up to it. Faith and Fate, the story of the Jewish people in the 20th century. Episode 1, The Dawn of the Century, 1900 to 1910. Jewish history has been going on for a very long time, almost 4,000 years since Abraham, the first Jew, and over 3,300 years since we stood at Sinai and received the Ten Commandments and the Torah. Jewish history is a continuum and it should be viewed in that context. To begin to understand any century of our history, we have to see the big picture. We have to see ourselves in an overview. Who are we? What is a Jew? What is our destiny? How and why have we survived until today? To follow the path of the Jews in the 20th century is to watch history's giant pendulum swing back and forth. At times it's visible, at times it's not. We are proud to be called the people of the book. We are a holy nation rooted in our past. The past is directly connected to our present. And both the past and the present, whether we understand it or not, will in one way or another impact on our future. At the beginning of the century, exactly as the predictions of the exile in the Torah and the prophets foretold, Jews were living in nearly every part of the world, a nation scattered across the earth. At that time, in the early 1900s, there were 10.5 million Jews in the world, less than one quarter of 1% of the world's population. The majority of them, 7.5 million, lived in Russia and Eastern Europe. One million were in North America. 500,000 in Germany. 200,000 in England. Half a million in the Arab countries. 50,000 in Ottoman-controlled Palestine and three to four hundred thousand in the rest of the world. The beginning of the 20th century was a time of empires, colonial expansionism, and imperial rule. In 1900, Great Britain, with its empire stretching from the Arabian Peninsula to India, to Australia, and Africa, was the dominant imperial power. Seeking to expand her colonies, Britain was embroiled in the Boer War, determined to take control of South Africa and its vast gold and diamond deposits. Germany, not satisfied with its smaller colonial empire in Africa, the Pacific Islands and China had expansionist ambitions to rival Great Britain. The once almighty Turkish Ottoman Empire, which had been in existence for nearly 600 years, was starting to crumble. The Ottomans struggled to maintain their hold over their Near and Middle East territories against increasing British and European imperial aggression. Across the Atlantic, America, intent on its own post-Civil War growth, concentrated on building its power from within, in direct contrast to Europe's imperialist, 
expansionist ambitions. Engraved on the Statue of Liberty, the words of Emma Lazarus echoed the philosophy of America. Not like the brazen giant with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here, at our sea-washed sunset gates, shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, Mother Exile. Keep your ancient lands, your storied pomp. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. This was in stark contrast to Imperial Russia, where the majority of world Jewry lived. There the Tsar reigned supreme, and the ruling class lived an elitist, privileged life. While most of Russia's masses, including Jews, lived a life of abject poverty. In 1905, there was a war between Russia and Japan. The Russians unexpectedly suffered a decisive defeat at the hands of the Japanese, which weakened Russia even further internally. And at the same time, there was a revolt within the Russian Empire against the Tsar. And there was a march in St. Petersburg on the palace of the Tsar, demanding what by today's standards would be modest demands to improve the lot of the workers and the peasants. Peasants were, of course, the vast majority of the population living in awful, awful, indescribable conditions. The Tsar's reaction to this march was to have his troops fire on the demonstrators. This sparked the masses of Russia, led by the revolutionary anarchists, socialists and communists, many of them Jews, to demonstrate and go on strike. The army was unable to control the rampaging mobs, and the country spun out of control. The Tsar agreed to create a parliamentary body to represent the Russian people, the Duma, but it was too little too late. By December, full-scale revolution broke out, and after much fighting, the Tsar's forces finally gained the upper hand. Throughout Russia, thousands died, and other thousands were exiled to Siberia. A year after its formation, the Duma was temporarily suspended by the Tsar. The 1905 revolution had failed to solve any of Russia's outstanding problems. A scapegoat for all these military and governmental disasters had to be found to divert the wrath of the masses away from the Tsar and his cruel, inept government ministers. The most convenient scapegoat was the Jews. In 1905 and 1906, Numerous pogroms broke out all over Russia. The Tsarist authorities did little to stop them, letting the population riot for several days before stepping in to prevent them turning against the government. Anti-Semitic posters and pamphlets did not help the situation. Records reveal that in 1905, mainly in a four-day period, between October the 31st and November the 3rd, there were 639 pogroms in Russia. 36,773 families were affected. The pogroms, a word that means riot in Russian, have a long tragic history. There are pogroms beginning in the middle of the 19th century. They reach a peak in 1881-82. Again, in 1903, in Kishinev. In Kishinev, in Western Russia, 50,000 innocent Jews were attacked and 49 killed. 86 others maimed and several hundred injured. 
more than 1,500 shops and houses were destroyed or plundered. The world was shocked. At the request of the American Jewish community, President Theodore Roosevelt forwarded a petition of protest to the Russian government, which they refused to accept. These pogroms had a tremendous long-run effect. First of all, a demographic one. It killed off not only Jews, but their potential children. Women were routinely raped. Many people were driven out of their senses. A second effect, in addition to depressing the number, the size of the Jewish population, was that it stimulated yet another wave of emigration. We've got to get out of here. This is untenable. From 1881 to 1912, 1.89 million Jews left the Russian Empire. It was almost 40% of the Jewish population. The vast majority came to the United States. 2% went to Canada, and about 2.5% went to Palestine. Others went to Western Europe and South America, mainly Argentina. It was the largest migration of Jews in history. Today, 80% of the American Jewish population originally comes from the Russian Empire and its successor state, the Soviet Union. There were also other waves of Jewish migration. Jews, mainly from England and later from Lithuania, lured by the discovery of diamonds, then gold, emigrated to South Africa. Jews also went to places as far away as Australia and South America. They were all motivated by one thing, a search for a better life. Looking back from our position of affluence in the 21st century, especially in America and the Western world, it is virtually impossible to comprehend how difficult life was at that time, especially for the Jews in Eastern Europe. In contrast, the Jews of Western Europe were living a life of relative security, affluence and social acceptance compared to their impoverished brethren in Eastern Europe especially Russia. I'm afraid that younger generation of American Jews in a very short period of time have forgotten that as recently as their grandparents' generation, the vast majority of Jews, perhaps 95%, were living in what we would call dire poverty. It was not uncommon for there to be one pair of shoes, at most, in a Jewish family. And children would take turns wearing those shoes when they had to go out in the mud and in the frost in the Russian winter. Certainly, one had only one garment for Shabbat and one garment for the weekday. The fundamental economic problem of Jews was that they could not, by law, own land. So Jews were deprived of the main means of earning a livelihood, namely farming. This was compounded by terrible political repression, which limited the Jews' access to higher education. So Jews became craftsmen, shoemakers, cobblers, tinsmiths, brushmakers. In Eastern Europe, you had 40% Jewish unemployment, 40%. You had 20% infant mortality. One out of five Jewish children did not live to the age of five. You had grinding poverty, you had pogroms, you had persecution, you had bigotry. So why remain Jewish, right? So along come the Marxists who say we're going to solve all of this. Or along come the Zionists who say we're all going to get out of here. Or along comes anybody who says, we have great ideas, the anarchists, whatever. These are all utopian ideas, and the Jewish people are by nature a utopian people. Whichever way the Jews turned to solve their problems, they still faced grassroots anti-Semitism, made worse by the attitude of the Russian Orthodox Church. 
The Tsar was against the Jews for religious reasons, and the, the tradition of Russia was that it was Holy Mother Russia. It was the Russian Orthodox Church. The, the Tsars uh, saw themselves as the protectors of the church. And uh, the Jews were infidels. You're talking about an autocratic, dictatorial rule uh, that had no room for the other. The miracle is uh, how Jews survived under the Tsar as long as they did and as well as they did. Because uh, from the beginning, the Romanovs were their sworn enemies. If you take the church, the Tsarist government, the horrible economy of the most backward state in Europe, these create conditions of almost unbearable tension and suffering to which Jews react by desperately looking for solutions. Some decided to leave for America. That meant giving up on Europe. Some decided to leave for Palestine. That meant giving up on Galut, even the attractive Galut of North America or South America. And some decided to go to socialism, which meant giving up on capitalism wherever it might be. And yet, still others decided to retreat within themselves to remain within the traditional, the spiritual and psychological walls of the ghetto and await the coming of the Messiah. All of them had one thing in common. They were attempts to solve the Jewish problem. For an increasing number of Jews, the answer was change. To reject the old Judaism and its Torah and traditional ways, which had sustained the Jews throughout their long history, and to reinvent themselves, to accommodate new ways of thinking and living. One major response to the Jewish problem was very obvious. Cease to be Jewish. If you're not Jewish, you will no longer suffer as a Jew. So Jews change their names, change their noses, change their religion, change their spouses, and try to disappear into the larger society. In some places, such as the United States, they were quite successful. In other places, such as Germany, they failed. One thing made these changes different from all previous generations. For the first time in Jewish history, under the impact and influence of the secular world in which they were living, Jews in increasing numbers voluntarily weakened under the pressure and began to look for non-Jewish ways to solve their problems. It all started when the powerful winds of the Enlightenment, the Haskalah, began to blow. Haskalah was the cultural shift towards modern secularism and away from traditional Torah Judaism. It began in the 18th century in England it then spread to France and Germany and culminated in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Kant posited that man is autonomous, that even God cannot rule over man's choices, and that man can solve all problems by his own efforts. And in fact, to rely upon God is, so to speak, a blasphemous. So mankind can do everything and has all the answers. That was the idea of the Enlightenment. And those ideas came to the Jewish world as well. This conflict over Jewish identity and the Jewish soul with forces for and against religion and belief in God has had a direct impact on Jewish history. It is a struggle that continues right up to the present day. To obtain a true perspective on Jewish history, we have to understand the answers to these questions. What is a Jew? What does it mean to be Jewish? What is Judaism? These questions and the answers to them lie at the very core and crossroads of Jewish history. Judaism believes there is one almighty God and at Mount Sinai, the Jewish people received and accepted an eternal and unchangeable divine mandate. 
the Torah. The Torah defines us, who we are as Jews, spells out our purpose, and teaches us how to live our lives according to God's will. To a major degree, what has defined Jewish history is the reaction of Jews to this divine mandate and their struggle with it. Traditional Jews accept it. Reformists attempt to redefine it. And rejectionists abandon it. Now whether or not we understand it or believe it even, God made an eternal covenant with the Jewish people. A promise that despite all of the trials and tribulations that have occurred throughout Jewish history, He will never abandon us and that there always will be a Jewish destiny and a meaningful Jewish future. God has kept this promise. We are here despite everything that has happened to us. The amazing fact is that we are still here. In spite of the severity of living conditions and the inroads of secularism, Judaism and Jewish observance was alive and well in Europe. And the Jewish spirit found inspiration in a variety of places. From the joyful and faith-endowed courts of the Hasidic Rebbes in Poland, Galicia, Hungary and the Ukraine to the Torah study halls of the Lithuanian yeshivot and the Jewish giants of the generation. The early part of the century produced some of the greatest figures in Jewish history. Uh, great piety, great scholarship, great innovation. The yeshivot rebuilt themselves. And they built themselves in a different fashion. All of this contributed to a very vibrant Jewish life. And you had holy men like uh, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan, the Chafetz Chaim. You had the great Hasidic Rabbeim, the Svat Emet, the Ger Rebbe, you know, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. You had great people that were around and were inspirational. Even within the yeshiva world, there were tensions and changes. One of the biggest developments was the Musa movement. The Musa movement was founded in the 1850s by Rabbi Yisrael Salanter. It was an attempt to introduce into Jewish life, in a practical fashion, the great ethical and moral ideas of Judaism so that they would be apparent in human behavior day in and day out. Rabbi Salanter understood well the threat of the Enlightenment, and he encouraged the study of Musa to strengthen the pillars of Judaism against the increasing onslaught of secularism. Uh, there was a great struggle against the Musa movement, but by the end of the First World War, the struggle had died. And the Musa movement uh, ruled supreme in the Lithuanian yeshiva world. Everything new in Jewish life causes tensions. Every innovation has opposition. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, all change is uh, painful, uh, even, even holy change. Whether it was religious innovation that took place in the yeshivot, Jewish workers fighting for labor reform, or the desire to modernize Judaism in Europe and America, the drive amongst Jews to better themselves, and in many cases to create a new Jew, if not even a new Judaism, was widespread. In fact, it was this drive that propelled much of the change in the 20th century. One has to realize that the yeshivot were like the only game in town. And the Jews couldn't go to universities. They had no outlet for their intellect. They had no outlet for their uh, scholarship. If you wanted to develop your mind, so to speak, you went to the yeshiva. That's where you got your knowledge. That's where you got your skills. So inside the yeshiva, there were a lot of bright people, but not all of whom were pious. Not all of whom were committed to orthodoxy. 
but the yeshiva gave them the outlet to develop themselves. And that's why the yeshiva produced socialists and communists and secular Zionists and Marxists, as well as producing great Russian yeshiva, rabbis, holy men. The yeshiva was a uh, tremendous intellectual furnace. And out of that furnace came different shapes, different forms. So in Valozhin, for instance, you could produce Bialik, and you could produce Rav Kook, and you could produce uh, Rabbi Zalman Meltzer and other of the great Russia yeshiva. And they all came from the same place. Bialik himself called it the intellectual factory of the Jewish people. But amongst all the intellectuals and leaders the yeshivot produced, not all of them had a positive impact on the future of the Jewish people. One student, Semyon de Manstein, who had studied at the Tells, Lubavitch, and Slobodka yeshivas, and received rabbinic ordination from one of the greatest rabbis of the time, became a Bolshevik well before the revolution. He was eventually appointed the first commissar for Jewish affairs in the Soviet government. In the Politburo of Lenin, uh, in the original communist group, there were many Jews, and yet they destroyed the Jewish people. So it's, a, uh, it's ironic at best. In the late 19th century, Jews suddenly were buffeted by many winds that hitherto had escaped them, namely modernity. What is Jewish identity in the modern age? How does one respond to all this? We can remain Jews, but we can do other things as well. We can go out of the ghetto physically and psychologically and enter the world. Re-enter history. How do you do that? Well, Zionism was one option. Zionism, the longing to return to the land of Israel, had been on the lips of Jews ever since the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the exile of the Jews from their homeland by the Romans in 70 CE. Over 1800 years later, in Vienna, journalist Theodor Herzl, an assimilated Jew, unleashed his Zionist dream of a Jewish settlement in the land of Israel. What Herzl was looking for was Zionism, as he saw it, to solve the problem of the Jews, anti-Semitism. Appalled at the false accusations of treason leveled against the only Jewish officer in the French general staff, Alfred Dreyfus, Herzl was motivated to find a solution. He considered several options. Herzl is searching for answers. Just to give you an idea how removed he was from things Jewish, he writes in his diaries, let's look for some solution that'll satisfy us all. Perhaps mass conversion. A major uh, pageant, the Jews, the prominent Jews will march up to the major cathedral in Vienna and baptize. No Jews, no anti-Semitism. He quickly dismissed that. Ultimately, Herzl focused his efforts on creating a homeland for the Jews and started a chain of events that continues to this day. Zionism says we want to be like other peoples. There's a naivete to it, of course, that once we have our normal state, we can live, quote, normal lives, then anti-Semitism disappears. Herzl tirelessly navigated the political wills and interests of the Jewish leaders, secular and religious, which opposed him. He traveled the world in an effort to enlist the agreement of the great powers in achieving his Zionist goal. In London, concerned with the large wave of Jewish immigration to England, a royal commission of the British Parliament assured him that England would favor a Jewish colony, not in the Holy Land, but in East African Uganda. When the 6th Zionist Congress convened in Basel in August 1903, the Uganda proposal, supported by Herzl, was the dominant issue. It provoked a firestorm of protest, led mainly by the Eastern European Zionist leaders, Chaim Weizmann and Menachem Yushiskin. 
By 1904, it was apparent that Zionism stood for the Jewish people's return to the land of Israel and no place else. Still, other Zionists brought their own visions to bear. Asher Ginsberg and his cultural Zionism. Aharon David Gordon and his belief in the holiness of the physical labor movement. And Joseph Berdachevsky with his negation of the exile and rejection of past Jewish tradition. Eventually, Chaim Weizmann, who was to become the first president of the State of Israel, and Nachum Sokolow led the Zionist movement. Herzl rallied the masses of Eastern Europe, who obviously were facing traditional anti-Semitism. He got short shrift, unfortunately, from the Jews of Western Europe. Their whole lifestyle was predicated on uh, acceptance within Berlin, Paris, London. The famous slogan of the reformers, Berlin is our Zion. They were very assimilated. Uh, some intermarried, of course. Western Jewry, which had been living in these countries for generations and had received the vote, were wedded to a good lifestyle where they would be accepted, where their loyalty would not be challenged, and they could practice privately whatever Judaism they wished. Zionism was a direct challenge to the idea of acculturation of assimilation. It wasn't only Western Jewry that was opposed to Zionism. Most of the traditional religious Jewish world opposed it, but for different reasons. Religious opposition to Zionism was based on ideology, on tactics, and on personalities. It was based on ideology, as Zionism claimed to be the alternative to faith, to religion. The tactical objection was that Zionism aligned itself with non-religious, if not even anti-religious forces. It thereby divested itself of all connection to holiness. And finally, personalities. Many Jews found it hard to believe that people who were assimilated, intermarried, who had no background in Judaism whatsoever, would somehow be the ones to lead the Jewish people to greatness. There were Orthodox leaders that went against the mainstream and supported religious Zionism. Under Rabbi Yitzchak Yaakov Reines, the rabbi of leader Lithuania, they formed the Mizrahi section within the mainly secular Zionist movement. Mizrah, facing east, is that movement where in Rhinus's view, one can fuse religion and nationalism and create here an institution or an ongoing operation which would bring Jews closer to Torah life. The contrary position taken by most Orthodox rabbis was that the Zionists were violating the idea that only God could return the Jews to their holy land. Wait for the Messiah, he will deliver you. The Zionists said, we are not only a religious group, we are a nation. Jews are a people. Jews are a nation no less so than the Italians or the Belgians or the French or the English or the Germans. And as such, as a nation, we need a state. Secular Zionism redefined the Jewish people. The new Zionist rejected the Torah as the foundation stone of Jewish existence. Their definition became their slogan. Our people are a nation because of culture, geography, nationalism and persecution. It was an idea religious Jewry could not accept. See, if you take a long view of the Jewish people, you realize that uh, the glue that held us together and that enabled us to survive till today was the fact that we were loyal to Torah and loyal to tradition. And that really is what helped create the State of Israel. Without it, it could never have been created. Now comes a new idea that none of this is necessary. So if you look at it in the view of a long-term history, it's absolutely suicidal to say these things. Because the only thing that worked for us is what you want to discard now. That makes no sense at all. 
This belief was also firmly held by the old Yeshuv, the religious Jews who had settled in Palestine in the late 1800s. The word Yeshuv means settlement. We understand that to mean the Jews living in Eretz Israel. We must distinguish between the religious Yeshuv, so-called the old Yeshuv, as well as the new Yeshuv, vibrant, young, committed ideologically to Zionism. The secular new Yeshuv began with the first Aliyah in 1882 of a group of idealistic university students from the Lovers of Zion movement. The second Aliyah from 1904 to 1914 set the pattern for ongoing Zionist immigration, mainly from Eastern Europe. However well-intentioned the efforts of the new Yeshuv were, the old Yeshuv dedicated to the divine prophecies of Jewish destiny and purpose in the Holy Land, rejected the solely secular nationalist ideals of the new Zionists. Unlike the Zionist immigrants, they refused to adopt Hebrew as the spoken language and reserved it as the holy tongue for prayer and Torah. By 1914, there were close to 85,000 Jews living in Palestine. Since the exile, there had always been a small remnant of Jews living in the Holy Land, mainly in Jerusalem. With the religious and Zionist immigrations in the late 1800s and early 1900s, it was the first time Jews in any significant numbers had returned to Zion, their homeland, in almost 2,000 years. During these tumultuous times, there was another group of Jews with a totally different life experience. They lived around the Mediterranean basin under Muslim rule in the Ottoman Empire, North Africa, and the Middle East, the Svardim. The word Sephardic comes from the Hebrew, actually. The word Sephardad is the Hebrew phrase, the Hebrew word for Spain. Those Jews would be called Sephardim who, after the expulsion from Spain in 1492, and went to Turkey, the Balkan countries, North Africa, who continued to speak Spanish. However, the term has also come to refer, in a broader sense, to a pan-Sephardic community, namely Jewish communities of the Middle East and North Africa, which follow essentially the same customs, halachic rulings, Jewish law rulings, the same basic liturgy, ritual patterns. And that would include communities such as the Syrian community, Iran, Iraq, uh, other communities in North Africa, even to a certain extent, Yemen, where there's a certain spiritual kinship among all of these Jews who lived primarily in, under Muslim rule during the last four or five hundred years. The Sephardim lived in their own communities in relative peace and isolated from the Ashkenazic brethren in Western and Eastern Europe. They developed their own rich cultural heritage with unique languages, foods, music, and dress. It doesn't mean that everyone in the Ottoman Empire loved Jews, not so. It doesn't mean that they didn't have some very strong prejudices against Jews, they had them. But in the Jews' private life, they were so enclosed in their own life, and they, their own communities, and their own world, Jews did enjoy a certain degree of freedom and happiness. And they were, I wouldn't say oblivious to external threat, but it wasn't a constant presence in their mind. And that made a difference. They had a very optimistic viewpoint on life. They lived in a sunny climate. So they sang beautiful songs all the time. Their inner life was in fact very strong and very rich. Although the Svartim also went through their own challenges, what happened to the Ashkenazic world in Europe never happened to them. They did not go through those forces that challenged tradition. They never went through the Enlightenment or Reform or the Communist Revolution. And because of this, they had a different worldview. There was a different way of dealing with life. And that way of life was, we maintain a traditional framework for our communities. They didn't like groups, they didn't form groups. They did not function with all these isms. They were aware of things, but they looked more to the need for the whole community to maintain one cohesive community. But with the advent of the new century, winds of change began to blow, ushering in new ideas, and with them, new waves of Jewish emigration. 
Sephardim were influenced by the idea of modernity, opportunity, choice, whereas in the past they were more fatalistic, accepting whatever happened as God's will. By the beginning of the 20th century, there already was a feeling of westernization that you didn't have to accept your fate. You could make your own life. The French influence was on the ascendancy beginning in the late 19th century because they established French-speaking schools throughout the Muslim world. And thousands upon thousands of children in the Sephardic communities were learning French as their first language. They also adapted into French culture. Some of them moved to France. Jews were moving away from the lands of origin to new opportunities. Many thousands went to the United States, while others moved to South America as they could speak Spanish. Others went to Europe, to Africa, and even India and Burma, establishing trading posts and becoming very successful. With the advent of Zionism, thousands moved from Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen to Palestine while the Ashkenazic and Sephardic communities were adapting to their new lives in America and elsewhere. Back in Europe, the growth of industrialization and the class struggle between workers and owners had a dramatic impact both on the Jews and the existing social order. The old imperial ruling classes were still in power. The Tsar ruled Russia, the Kaiser controlled Germany, and the British Empire still reigned supreme. But for the workers, the issue of the day was the struggle to survive. In the factories themselves, the conditions were miserable, including factories owned by Jews. Some of the suffering Jewish workers, their fury unleashed, became the future leaders of the labor unions, both in Eastern Europe and later in the United States. The socialists believed that the fundamental problem of the world was the exploitation of the working class by the capitalists, the owners, and that it was class divisions, not ethnic, religious, racial divisions, that were at the core of the human condition. Once the class issue would be resolved, and once the people who produced goods that had worth would own the means of production, all of these problems, not only economic and political, but also racial, ethnic, and religious, would be solved. The fiery spirit of the Jewish workers coalesced into a formal socialist Jewish labor movement in Europe which took the form of local organizations called workmen's circles. Eventually, they merged and became a major labor union called the General Jewish Workers' Union, or the Bund, as it was commonly referred to. It fought for a shorter working day, for higher wages, for non-exploitation by the bosses, for equality between men and women, for friendship between Jews and non-Jews. And that was a very attractive point because if everyone was socialist and everyone believed that everyone was equal, anti-Semitism would disappear. The Polish worker would no longer hate the Jewish worker, he would only hate the Polish boss. Initially, the Bund was not anti-religious, but it became an ideological movement that embraced Jewish culture and scorned religion and ritual. The Bund held its banquets and festivities on Yom Kippur, it organized the popular school system and used Yiddish as its language and promoted a militant, secular and socialist mandate. It opposed the use of the Hebrew language and was anti-Zionist. Here again, a Jewish group tried to author another version of the new Jew. It believed that the Zionists had two problems, which were unforgivable. One, the Zionists would unite all of the Jews irrespective of class. And the Zionists thought that all Jews were part of a single nation. But how can you put a Jewish merchant together with a Jewish worker? We need, as socialists, class struggle, not an artificial unification of the people. 
The second mistake of the Zionists from the Bundes point of view was that they were trying to devise an absolutely unrealistic scheme. Does one really think that millions of East European Jews would pick up and go to some godforsaken backwater of the Ottoman Empire somewhere far off in the Middle East? That's absurd. So on these two grounds, the Bund was anti-Zionist. The Bund was originally attached to the Social Democratic Party in Russia, but due to its commitment to Yiddish and Jewish culture, the Russian socialists eventually attacked them. When the Bund tried to relegate Jewish tradition to memory, it was the Bundist that became history. When the Bolsheviks came to power in Russia in 1917, and then later in Poland in 1939, almost all of the leaders of the Bund were eliminated, and the organization was crushed. Perhaps the hundreds of thousands of Jewish immigrants thought that by leaving Europe they would leave behind the poverty, anti-Semitism and ideological winds of change when they came en masse to the United States in the 1900s. But, in a sense, other than the material opportunity to succeed and escape poverty, they replaced one set of challenges to their Jewish identity with another. When Jews came to America in the early 20th century, there were two options open to them. Do you lose your faith? Do you throw it away? Or do you hold on and you say, they can take everything away from me, but they can't take away my faith? The other option was melting pot. Namely, you come to America and you melt down and become a cookie cutter American like everybody else. That melting pot is the public school. Melting pot is the settlement house. Melting pot is the ideology of America. The challenges of the Jewish immigrants coming to America are employment, language, a different social structure, and a completely new society. And the entire ethos of America was to make everybody American. And to become American, you have to become less Jewish. That's what they believed. There were those who, of course, rejected, simply rejected Torah. Uh, they came from Europe and uh, the, the stories of the people who threw their tefillin overboard and things like that. And yet, when you read what was going on at that time, you realize that the vast majority did not want to let go, but let it go little by little, piece by piece. And the first thing to go was Shabbos. The metaphor I would use is that the tefillin are not thrown overboard, and when they arrive and they live in their tenements on the Lower East Side or other such neighborhoods, that the fill and start on the top of the bureau, and over the course of the years, that the fill and slowly but surely move down to the bottom of the drawer as work considerations, social considerations, take precedence over religious observance. There were several factors that conspired to sever the ties between traditional Jewish life and the new immigrant Jewish family. At the core was the difficulty of being able to find a job that would not necessitate violating the Sabbath, the difficulty of procuring kosher food, the continued use of Yiddish for teaching and sermons, and most significantly, the lack of an educational system for the young generation that would make Judaism appealing and relevant. the overwhelming majority of immigrants send their youngsters to American public schools because they want to see their youngsters acculturated to this country. But when they go to the public schools, in addition to learning the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, they also learn a very important D, disrespect for their parents' culture. At that time, to be an immigrant was a terribly shameful thing to be, and so they associated the religion of their parents with uh, an immigrant generation. They were ashamed of them. Many men simply ashamed of them, because the parents dressed differently, spoke differently, ate different foods. 
one answer to the problem was to try and balance the best of both worlds, to become American and to retain one's Jewish identity. As early as the first few years of the 20th century, there's a movement on the Lower East Side to create American synagogues for the children of East European Jews. The earliest incarnation of this phenomenon was an organization called the Jewish Endeavor Society. And what they endeavored to do was to maintain the core of the Orthodox service and build in a variety of American activities. In other words, take some of the teachings of the public schools, take some of the teachings of the settlement houses and Judaize them within a religious context. So therefore, you'd have some of the prayers recited in English as well as in Hebrew. You would have the Malava Malka, Mozart e Shabbos would be transformed into a synagogue social with the idea being that they come to play and they stay to pray. Now, all these efforts represents the beginnings of what we would call uh, modern orthodoxy or American orthodoxy. Although many Jews go off and assimilate, maintaining the core of the orthodox service and building around it an American type of activity is something which will resonate throughout the, throughout the 20th century. However, the American immigration experience was not limited only to European Jews. Sephardic Jews were also coming to America in search of new opportunities. They not only found a very different culture, but they met a very different group of Jews, the Ashkenazim. The first meetings created very often cultural clashes. These were people, brothers and sisters basically, who had been separated from each other for centuries and centuries, who recognized they were the same people, who recognized they believed in the same God and the same Torah and the same religion, etc., but whose mannerisms and way of speaking were radically different. The Ashkenazim spoke Yiddish. The Sephardim were speaking Ladino or, or Judeo-Spanish or Arabic or other languages from other lands. The Ashkenazim asked, what are your name? Last name, Romi, Al-Hadef, Polikar. They didn't recognize these as Jewish names. Have you ever heard of Gefiltevish? What's Gefiltevish? They ate different foods, they had different style, different language, different everything. Ashkenazic ears weren't used to Sephardic pronunciation. But in those days when they heard the Sephardic reading Hebrew, they thought it was Arabic. So even though in fact there's one religion and one people, there are enough little nuances that uh, create tensions and differences among the people. Despite the problems, Jews, especially from the earlier German immigration, mainly to New York in the late 1800s, were beginning to succeed in America. In 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt named Oscar S. Strauss Secretary of Commerce and Labor. He was the first Jew named to a cabinet position and was known for his opposition to exclusionist immigration policies. German Jews were particularly successful in banking and commerce. Marcus Goldman founded Goldman Sachs and Company. Henry Emanuel and Mayer Lehman, Lehman Brothers. Abraham Kuhn and Solomon Loeb, Kuhn Loeb and Company. Jacob Schiff, an investment banker, became the leading Jewish philanthropist. And Charles Bloomingdale, who started Bloomingdale's. In contrast to the assimilated German Jews, the new wave of immigrants, mainly religious Jews from the impoverished settles of Eastern Europe, as well as the enlightened secular Jews with their socialist ideas, encountered challenges in America's democratic capitalist society. 
the Bund, Jewish socialists, come to America, and they have the same problem as do transplanted East European rabbis. Namely, how do you perpetuate an ideology or a theology which has great popularity in Europe in an America which offers a very different set of values? For the religious, even though there was freedom of religion in America, there was the challenge of assimilation. For the socialists, their atheist, anti-capitalist views were seen as un-American. While the religious immigrants from the shtetl remained moored on the shores of tradition, they watched helpless as the powerful current of American culture quickly swept their children and grandchildren downstream. In this seemingly inhospitable environment, there were Jews who would not give up on Torah study and observance. A small school started in 1896, Eitz Chaim, would eventually become the parent of today's Yeshiva University. In 1904, Yeshiva Chaim Berlin was formed in Brooklyn, New York. Though Eitz Chaim and Chaim Berlin became the pioneers of what later would become the religious day school movement, the fruits of their efforts would not manifest for almost 50 years. And, although a number of great, well-respected European rabbis came to America in the early 20th century, the assimilation of the younger generation rendered them almost irrelevant. In 1902, Rabbi Jacob Joseph, the first and only chief rabbi of New York, died of a broken heart in reduced circumstances after struggling valiantly to stem the tide. While these orthodox rabbis maintained a purely survivalist position, other structures and organizations arose to try and meet the needs of the new immigrants. It was against this backdrop that many American Jews would seek to redefine their Judaism. Reform Judaism, which had begun in Germany in the 19th century, and decades later established itself in America, followed its mandate of reforming Judaism. By then, it had already eliminated many basic tenets of traditional observance. Sabbath services were held on Sunday. Hebrew was erased from prayer, as was any mention of the land of Israel. The difference, or one of the differences, between Reform and Orthodoxy is that Reform denied the divinity of the biblical text and accepted those parts as guides to behavior and to thought which it found attractive, the moral and the ethical. Those parts which people deemed to be irrelevant or even obnoxious, such as the laws of Kashrut, which would prevent them from social intercourse with many of their neighbors, their non-Jewish neighbors. These were not of divine origin. These were part of ancient Near Eastern superstitious beliefs, which in a modern and progressive society could be abandoned. And though these innovations did not appeal to most immigrants from Eastern Europe, they did appeal to many of their children and grandchildren. Reform became a symbol of acceptance into modern American society, upward social mobility, and a way of keeping their Jewish identity. The first communal institutions, the New York Jewish Federation, controlled by Reform Jews, originally from Germany, and the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, founded in 1881 by Russian immigrants, while doing significant work in helping the new arrivals, put pressure on them to compromise their religious observance in order to help them integrate into an American society. The irony of history tells us that those who tried to modernize Jewish identity and practice in order to ensure Jewish survival and vitality, in fact contributed to a far different outcome 100 years later. 
since traditional Eastern European orthodoxy still had many hurdles to leap in America and reform did not attract most immigrants, a vacuum appeared. A new, more modern, English-oriented, yet halachically Torah-correct synagogue service emerged. Called Young Israel, it became a positive influence and saved many families who wanted to remain religious. Still, another institution was founded, originally by Orthodox rabbis in 1886. The Jewish Theological Seminary was dedicated to training English-speaking rabbis and teachers. When it was on the verge of collapse, it was rescued by the noted philanthropist Jacob Schiff, and then transformed under the leadership of Dr. Solomon Schechter. A familiar theme reappeared, as Dr. Schechter proposed his new definition of Judaism. It is not the mere revealed Bible that is of first importance to the Jew, but the Bible as it repeats itself in history. In other words, the interpretation of the Bible as influenced by changing historical times. This meant the center of authority was removed from the Torah and placed in the collective conscience of what Dr. Schechter called Catholic Israel, meaning a consensus of the whole of the community of Israel as embodied in the universal synagogue movement which he started. This initiative became conservative Judaism. At the beginning, conservative and orthodox Judaism did not radically differ. However, Soon the seminary produced rabbis that permitted their modern American congregants mixed seating and a relaxation of certain religious laws. By the end of the first decade of the 20th century, it was clear that conservative Judaism was becoming yet another force convinced that the only way to conserve Judaism was to bend it to the will of American life and customs and not the other way around. However, these religious movements were an outgrowth of the European Ashkenazic experience. A profound difference between the Ashkenazim and the Svardim was that the Svardim in the main never doubted or changed their Jewish tradition or their devotion to Torah or allegiance to God. We didn't know about Reform or Conservative or Orthodox until we came to the United States. All the synagogues were Orthodox. They were all traditional synagogues. The people who came to the synagogue, some would be more observant orthodoxly, some would be less observant orthodoxly. But together, they did not believe in establishing different synagogues or different movements. And to this day, there's, I don't think there's one syn Sephardic synagogue that's officially a member of a reformer conservative movement. 1900 to 1910 was a decade of mass Jewish immigration to new lands of hope and opportunity a decade that witnessed the evolution of new social, economic, and political ideologies, and the drive to create a new Jewish state in Palestine. Once again, as throughout their history, Jews were facing radical new challenges, while around them, the imperial race was escalating. The empires of the old order were expanding their ambitions. Alliances were being made between the major continental powers who were beginning to face off. All the empires of Europe increased their stocks of arms and modernized their weapons of war. The situation was deteriorating. All this would eventually impact on the unfolding story of the Jewish people. For Jews, there would now be two worlds of change to confront in the coming decade. First, the large cataclysmic changes wrought by World War I and the Communist Revolution of 1917. And second, the continued fierce desire of Jews in Europe, America, and the rest of the world to recast their Jewish identity as they struggled somehow to determine 
how they would fit in socially, economically, and religiously. How difficult and how devastating, especially for European Jewry, the Great War and the Russian Revolution would be, no one could have ever imagined. For more on Jewish history, go to jewishhistory.org.